de tener al doctor Carol Michelian, es egresado de la Universidad de Alberta en Canadá y es investigador titular del Instituto de Física de la UNAM y es autor de la teoría disipativa del, del origen y evolución. No sé si está funcionando. Eh, sí. Uh, ok. Thank you very much to the organizers, particularly Penelope. This talk is going to be in English. You're going to understand me a lot better in English than you will in Spanish. So please bear with me. Okay, so what is the origin of homo chirality? Uh, that's a very difficult question because obviously it must be related with the origin of life. And so before I can attempt to give you an honest answer to the origin of chirality, I will have to try to give you a plausible explanation for the origin of life. And I'll do that through this uh, thermodynamic dissipation theory of the origin and evolution of life. Uh, basically, this theory says that life's function, basic function of life, is to convert sunlight into heat. Okay, so it's a dissipative function. And uh, all of the structuring which is associated with life, all of the fundamental molecules of life, must also be then dissipative structures. And I'll explain what those are in a minute. And also the proliferation or the replication of these molecules must be through dissipation also. And we'll see that's where homo, homo chirality comes into play. Okay, but before I, I go on to the theory, I have to explain a little bit about the physical conditions of Earth at uh, 3.85 thousand million years ago. That's a long time ago, and it might seem that uh, there's no possible way I could describe what the conditions were like after such a long time in the past. But uh, we can make some very simple assumptions. For example, that the interior of the Earth was hotter because there was more radioactivity. So there would have been more volcanic activity. And these volcanoes would have been spewing out uh, hydrogen sulfide, water, carbon dioxide, just the same gases which are exposed today from volcanoes. And uh, the seas were hot, about 85 degrees centigrade. And we know that from the oxygen isotope ratios uh, found in sediments of that era. Okay, and the atmosphere was similar, to, sorry, what it was today, it had a lot of nitrogen, uh, a, a lot more carbon dioxide, a lot of water vapor, and uh, methane, and maybe even some hydrogen gas. But there was no oxygen and no ozone. The oxygen and the ozone come from life from photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, which started about 1,000 million years after the origin of life. So therefore, with no oxygen, there would be no ozone. And therefore, the light, the ultraviolet light, which was coming into the Earth's surface, must have been very intense. And so what, in fact, did the solar spectrum look like? Well, we did this calculation here, taking the sun through time. The sun has uh, changed in its output intensity about 30% since the origin of life. Uh, and also included atmospheric extinction due to absorption and scattering, and including a, atmosphere, a pressure of about two atmospheres, twice the pressure of today's atmosphere. Well, this yellow line is the spectrum today, as it exists on the surface of the Earth, with the sun directly overhead. And this spectrum in black, is what existed at the origin of life. Now, I want to bring your attention to this little peak here in the ultraviolet in the UVC. It peaks around 260 nanometers. And um, it existed on the surface of Earth. This light was coming down to the surface of Earth for a thousand million years. Okay? So life must have somehow adapted to it, at least. What I'm suggesting is that it was the formation, it was the generalized thermodynamic potential which gave rise to the structuring of life. Okay, now to get into dissipative structuring, uh, there are two classes of structures in nature. One class is our equilibrium structures, and these, are, these come about through the minimization of a generalized thermodynamic potential, for example, the Gibbs potential constant temperature and pressure. For example, we have uh, crystal, crystalline structures in the solar system. These are examples of equilibrium structures. But there are also non-equilibrium structures. And these are dissipative structures. These arise through the optimization of the dissipation 
of some generalized thermodynamic potential. So examples that we're familiar with, for example, the hurricanes, uh, Bernard cells, these two examples are dissipating the temperature gradient over the system. We also have belousov zabotinsky reactions, which are dissipating chemical potentials. And what I'm going to conjecture or suggest, propose, is that DNA is also a dissipative structure. It's not an equilibrium structure. You won't get it through optimizing uh, Gibbs potential energy. And it was formed through the dissipation of these ultraviolet photons. OK, so what are dissipative structures? Well, first I'll give the common example of the macroscopic dissipative structuring. This is over coordinate degrees of freedom. So this example, everybody knows the Bernard cells. We have a liquid, which is sandwiched between two plates, the bottom plate hot and the top plate cold, over the force of gravity. So this system, as long as the gradient of temperature is not too great, uh, comes to a stationary state, which is known as conduction. This is the view from the top of the Bernard cell apparatus. But as the temperature gradient goes beyond some critical value, then all of a sudden you get the formation of structures. You saw the Bernard cells, convection cells. Now, in this state, we're in a nonlinear regime. Linear means with respect to the flows and the forces. So the flow is the flow of heat, and the force is the gradient of the one over the temperature. Okay, so in the nonlinear regime, we have a new stationary state. And we can have possibly more than one stationary state. In fact, for the Bernard cell, there are really two stationary states. Okay? One is with the hot liquid coming up in the center of the cell and then cooling down and going around the edges. And the other stationary state is the hot liquid coming up around the edges of the cell, cooling off and going down in the center. So there are two stationary states available to the system. And which state does nature take? Which is most probable? Both of these have a probability, but the state in which the hot liquid is coming up through the center has greater entropy production, and that turns out to be the state which nature uh, usually takes. So when we get to this nonlinear regime, we can all of a sudden have a bifurcation in the solution. So if we plot here, for example, the gradient of 1 over the temperature of the force that at a given uh, gradient of temperature, we get these two possibilities, two different stationary states depending on how the water is, or the liquid is flowing through the Bernard cell. Okay, but there also exists microscopic dissipative structuring. And in this case, uh, this is sober over molecular degrees of freedom. So here uh, we talk about isomerizations, telomerizations, electronic, vibrational, rotational excitations, uh, charge transfer, exiplex formation, and uh, the example I'll give today is adenine, which is a base of DNA. This is a photochemical reaction which produces adenine from four hydrogen cyanide molecules in water. Okay, and um, this was first seen by Ferris and Orgel in 1966, but it wasn't considered at that time a dissipative structuring. Okay, I published this in, in 2017. And uh, what I'd like to bring your attention to is, well, the first step here, which is the production of cis-dam, is a thermal reaction, okay, so a normal chemical reaction. And it, this corresponds to the most stable state of four hydrogen cyanide molecules. Okay, but then it, it can absorb a photon, and we have a rotation around this double bond. Okay, just this has been rotated 180 degrees, okay, and uh, that is an uphill reaction. So it requires the absorption of a photon. Okay. Uh, then, in fact, this is really a schematic diagram because there are really three absorptions of other three photons which are occurring in order to get to this. Finally, to the indole, which is adenine. But what I'd like to bring your attention to is that um, in each of these steps, the absorption of the molecule goes, for example, here from 290. Remember, this is the, the light which was coming in in the UVC range to a surface in the RKN. Uh, here we have very little light in this first step, so there's very little absorption. Uh, in the second step, 
we're absorbing at 326 nanometers. It's more light, but this light is not very entropy producing because it's longer wavelength. And uh, as we go through these steps, in step three, we're absorbing at 250. And finally, we settle down step four, which is adenine, which absorbs at 260 and uh, very efficiently. Okay, so not only uh, the basis of DNA absorbed very strongly in this UVC range, but also, sorry, also uh, the other fundamental molecules of life. For example, the amino acids, fatty acids, coenzymes, cofactors, these all seem to be UVC pigments, pigments, you know, and they all, if you plot their maximum absorption cross-section, the wavelength at which they absorb maximally, you'll find that they lie very nicely on this UVC peak, which was coming into Earth in the Archean. So the idea is that all of these fundamental molecules of life, these are the molecules which are in the three domains of life, which are the archaic, the bacteria, and the eukaryote. Okay, all of these fundamental molecules are dissipative structures, microscopic dissipative structures. Okay, and not only do they absorb very strongly, but they also dissipate their electronic excitation energy very rapidly. Uh, this is uh, work done by Kang et al., which is an experiment. They use a pump, pump uh, which is 260 nanometer, uh, to excite the molecule. And then they measure with a delayed probe, which is another wavelength, which they used to determine the population of the excited state as a function of time. And we see that the electronic excited state decays very rapidly, sub-picosecond. This is the case for uh, these bases of DNA and RNA. Also the case for adenine, which is done here. And how do they do this? How do they dissipate their electronic excitation energy so rapidly? In fact, so rapidly that there is no time for chemical reactions to occur. And uh, therefore, they're extremely stable these systems with respect to absorption of ultraviolet light. Well, they do that through a conical intersection. And this occurs when the vibrational states superimposed on the electronic excited state coincide with the vibrational states superimposed on the ground state, ground electronic state. Okay? And, so, uh, and, and it does that by just, you can't see it here, but there's a deformation in the, one of these carbon atoms comes out of the plane along with the hydrogen. And uh, this deformation in the nuclear coordinates causes that these two vibrational states, one of the electronic excited state and the other of the ground state, they, are, they become degenerate. And so the energy goes very quickly to the ground state, okay, in sub-picosecond times. Okay, so therefore uh, RNA and DNA are excellent dissipative structures. So they take one photon in the ultraviolet, absorb it, and dissipate it very rapidly into about 30 photons in the infrared. So this is exactly what a hurricane is doing. You know? But a hurricane is taking infrared light, absorbing it, and then dissipating it into far infrared light in the upper atmosphere. One is, uh, this is microscopic, and this is macroscopic dissipative structuring. So, but not all of the fundamental molecules have this conical intersection. So even though some fundamental molecules absorb very strongly in the UVC, uh, they don't dissipate it. They stay in the excited state. So if they stay in the excited state, chemical reactions can occur. Chemical reactions are more uh, prominent in the excited state than in the ground state. And, uh, but they, however, they, if they have an attraction to a molecule, another molecule, which has a conical intersection, then the energy can be passed through this resonant energy transfer from, for example, tryptophan, which absorbs very strongly in the UVC but stays in the excited state and fluoresces or, or produces chemical reactions. It can pass the energy directly to the DNA, which has a conical intersection, and then very rapidly gets dissipated to the ground state. So these two systems together, the tryptophan with DNA, is a greater complex, uh, this complex is a greater dissipating system and, and that is, in fact, all of evolution. Evolution is just the complexation to ever greater dissipation. Okay, and that dissipation is sunlight, uh, once in the UVC and now in the visible. Okay, but there's one more element that I have to include before getting to homochirality, because that's what this talk is about. 
which is the proliferation or the replication of RNA and DNA. Now, this has to be enzymeless because these enzymes are very complicated protein molecules. These enzymes which help DNA replicate today couldn't, could not have existed at the origin of life. And so we need the physical conditions at the Earth's surface which could have provided a replication. And our reason for the replication, again, has to be dissipation because no irreversible process occurs without dissipation. That is the principal reason for the surgeons or the existence of an irreversible process. Okay, so this is what we call ultraviolet and temperature-assisted reproduction. So I told you that the oceans at the origin of life were very hot, about 85 degrees centigrade, and they were slowly cooling throughout the Archean. So when they got to a temperature below about 85 degrees centigrade, which is the denaturing temperature of these short-strand DNA, then this DNA that had been formed through dissipative structuring would have been stuck in this double helix form. But as the sun rose you know, and heated the ocean surface, and also the ultraviolet photons were absorbed on this double-strand DNA, we could have denaturing of DNA. Okay? And uh, there is an effect, an increase in dissipation with denaturing. This is called the hyperchromic effect. When DNA denatures, then the bases are more exposed to the sunlight, and they absorb a bunch more light when they are uh, piled one on top of the other in the double strand DNA. And uh, then at night, uh, when the ocean surface cooled, they could again uh, find their, their complementary segments of uh, DNA and uh, renature. And so you have two where you had one, so that's replication. And uh, well, this is template directed, so it's autocatalytic. No? It's being, this is the template which is producing in the second strand. So it's autocatalytic photochemical reaction. And the important thing is that this replication is tied to photon dissipation, UVC-induced denaturing of DNA. So, okay, so we did the experiment. Here we have a, a lamp, a deuterium lamp, that give us ultraviolet light. Here we have the DNA in solution and temperature controlled, and we have two spectrometers, one for the absorption and the other one for the, for the scattering. So here's the spectrum. This is our data. 25 base pair synthetic DNA. So we see this hypochromic effect. This is a function of temperature, 30 degrees here and 80 degrees here. So we have double strand here and single strand there. And these uh, curves below are just the different spectra taken around these temperatures. About three degree Brin around these temperatures gives this different spectra. So these are the contributions to the hypochromism of DNA. Okay, so that was uh, temperature-induced denaturing, but what about ultraviolet light-induced denaturing? So what we did in the experiment was that we raised the temperature to 40 degrees centigrade for salmon sperm DNA, and then we turned on and off the ultraviolet light. And what happened, what we observed is that the extinction, which is the absorption plus a little, little small amount of scattering, increased as a function of time for about half hour, and we turned it off, and then it decreased, and we turned it on, and it increased. So we're getting this hypochromic effect. So we're getting denaturing of DNA through ultraviolet light. Uh, we saw that more specifically as a function of wavelength, because this was integrated over this wavelength range. But we did it uh, again for 25 base pair DNA, and we looked at the spectra. And so you can actually see here, this is these different colors of temperature. As you go up, we increase the temperature. So it has a very strong temperature dependence which we measured also. This is the temperature dependence of uh, UVC light-induced denaturing. So we have a very strong uh, dependence on temperatures. The temperature gets close to the denaturing temperature of DNA. Okay, so what happens then? A photon comes in, gets absorbed on one of the bases. The energy gets spread over the DNA, and then we get finally uh, some denaturing, you know, and most probably at the ends of the DNA. Okay, now to get to homochirality, uh, I can explain now very simply how homochirality would have arised in this ultraviolet and temperature-assisted denaturing scheme. So uh, we know molecules come in two forms if they have this alpha carbon, and uh, one is right or left-handed, and that just means that they absorb differently right-handed circularly polarized light compared to left-handed circularly polarized light. And the difference here is just this dichroism spectrum. This is for different samples of DNA. 
And this sample here in red is uh, DNA with tryptophan. And it should be multiplied by four times. You have to multiply by four times, so it goes, sorry. So it goes um, to the bottom of the graph here. And uh, this is the, now we do the convolution over the absorption spectrum. And over the light, incident light spectrum, we get this. And so we find around about 258 nanometers where DNA is absorbing very strongly. We find that uh, for right-handed DNA, this is for right-handed DNA, it absorbs more light you know, and would therefore more likely be um, denatured. Uh, well, what breaks the symmetry, okay, what breaks the symmetry is that, uh, okay, we have the sun coming in on the ocean surface, the, the DNA is at the ocean surface, and uh, we get one scattering here, which produces plain polarized light, which then gets internally reflected at the ocean surface, and that produces uh, circularly polarized light. And that circularly polarized light depends whether it's in the morning or the afternoon. If it's in the afternoon, it could be, for example, right-handed, circularly polarized light. If it's in the morning, it would be left-handed. But then what breaks the symmetry with respect to denaturing through ultraviolet light is the ocean surface temperature. Because as I, as I explained, you can't see it here, but this is the temperature dependence, which goes up very quickly with temperature, the rate of denaturing through ultraviolet light. So uh, therefore, that breaks the symmetry, and we have uh, the production of homoid chirality. So now we can just do it quantitatively to determine how long it would take to arrive at 100% homo, homo chirality. And uh, we do that with this recursion relation, which is the number of the left-handed DNA in a given generation, which is a day, because each generation, each cycle is, is, a, is a day, okay, is equal to the number in the previous day times some factor which depends on the amount of photons that the DNA has absorbed, obviously, you know, with a, with a normalization, a parameter which represents the quantum efficiency for denaturing. And so this is for left-handed DNA, this is for right-handed DNA. And now we make a few assumptions that this parameter for quantum efficiency is very small, uh, so that it takes, like, let's say, a thousand photons to denature one single DNA, okay? And that we have this right circular polarized light excess in the afternoon, which I said was 5% uh, produced by this, this effect, okay, thank you. Uh, produced by this effect of scattering, and then total internal reflection at the ocean surface. And this, in fact, this 5% is, in fact, where the greatest, this is the greatest amount of circularly polarized light that you will find on Earth is at the ocean surface, okay? And the closer you are to the ocean surface, the greater this percentage. And the, the more uh, the sun is to the horizontal, also the greater the amount of polarization. Um, so taking these factors then in this right circular dichroism of DNA, and then just putting the probability for a right-handed photon being absorbed on a right-handed DNA equal to one, then you can convince yourself that these, these, the other probabilities are just these, these factors with these uh, constants involved. And uh, then we can form the chirality, which is just the number of left minus the number of right over the sum of the two. And uh, then just do the recursion relation. And this is, these are the graphs that we find here. Well, you don't see it here, but uh, this, which is DNA with tryptophan, would take about 1.4 million, million years, 1.4 million years to get to 100% of my chirality. And uh, this, which is the short strand DNA, would take about 19,000 years. So that's really nothing in the origin of life or the time that life has on the Earth. Because as I said, this light was coming in for 1,000 million years to Earth's surface. So, uh, and now if we include, in fact, uh, another factor, which is the energy factor. So if we have a energy discrimination that we say denaturing is only occurs if we have a certain amount of energy absorbed by the ultraviolet photons, and we include uh, uh, a distribution, a Gaussian distribution of the fluctuations of the absorption, then we get these other curves. So we see here for tryptophan with DNA, it only takes 137 years with this energy threshold to get to 100% home chirality. Okay, so that is what we believe is the, uh, the origin of 
Homo chirality, if you believe this theory, of course, of the, dissipation, the thermodynamic dissipation theory of the origin of life. But it's, it's rather very simple to describe once you accept that theory. And there are a lot of other evidence which I haven't been able to present today, but uh, I have a book, and I'll give you the direction for that. But just to sum up then, life's basic function, function is to turn sunlight into heat. It's a dissipative function. And the structuring of these molecules, all of the fundamental molecules of life, were at one time, at the beginning of life, were dissipative structures. Okay? And there was this dissipative proliferation through this uv tar physical mechanism. And because of the dichroism of DNA, and because of the temperature dependence and the fact that in the afternoon the temperature of the ocean surface is warmer, you arrive very quickly at uh, homo chirality. So uh, before ending, I'd just like to thank my students, my collaborators. Uh, uh, some of the students are here. For example, Zulema is here, and Oscar and Ivan. Uh, Oscar is studying now the dissipative structuring of fatty acids, and uh, Ivan is studying the, the pH dependence of this ultraviolet light uh, denaturing process. Okay, and thanks to Degapa for Pete. So uh, for any of you who are interested in further details, uh, you can get this, download this book uh, from here from my research gate page, okay, without cost, of course. And uh, I have all of the details, and I'll be very uh, grateful for any criticisms or comments or whatever, writing in my direction or asking here. Thank you very much. Tenemos tiempo para dos preguntas. Finalmente, yo pienso que el, el, el estado humo quiral también es una estructura uh, uh, disipativa. ¿La qué? Eh, 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 también es una estructura como que es disipativa. DNA, sí. ¿no? Porque yo puedo decir que quizá el, el estado racémico es el termodinámico. Pero, ok, hablando de racémico, esa es la única pregunta que no hablaste sobre eso, pero quizá tú contemplaste este. Obviamente, en este proceso largo, Uh, anticipado ¿no? de, 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 de la formación de la homoquiralidad de, de tus uh, moléculas, también tienes procesos de racimización. ¿Procesos de qué? De, de racimización de estas moléculas. ¿no? Entonces, si, si son tantos años, obviamente también están racimizando. ¿no? Claro, so, sí. ¿Contemplaste <coughs> también estos efectos en, 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 en estas pues, predicciones? Sí, no, claro. Uh, hay, uh, se pueden... I'm going to speak in English, okay. Okay, okay yeah, they can uh, race make again, they can become race make no, and they will with temperature. No, these, let's say, these bases which are floating on the ocean, ocean surface, okay. But uh, through at night, when we have um, extinction occurring on DNA, so we're forming the other uh, strand, you know, the complementary strand, then we're selecting only those which are right handed. You know, that's how you get to homochirality through that selection process. So they will continue race make, mixing, and you would have maybe a race mix uh, concentration always you know, of them on the surface of, but they're being selected because the right-handed ones can denature, and without denaturing, you can't have replication. Okay. El fenómeno de homoquiralidad empezaría muy, muy al principio de todos estos procesos que desencadenaron después a la vida. Yeah, uh, most people believe that uh, homoquirality had to be incorporated somehow into the origin of life, because, uh, well, everything that we know is that all of the the fundamental molecules of life have one chirality, you know, like the amino acids are all right-handed and, uh, sorry, left-handed and the DNA is always right-handed, RNA is right-handed. 
we believe that these molecules were really the fundamental molecules because they're in the three domains of life. So uh, somehow, homochirality, you have to have another theory to incorporate it, or you have to have two chirality structures which are operating at the same time and evolving at the same time. Because if you have a racemic mix, we find that if there's no selection process, then uh, those bases which have the wrong chirality stop the extension. They limit the extension in the nighttime. So there's no, um, so there's no replication. No? So if, if we have the wrong chirality here, we won't get extension. Extension stops at that point. So it had to be, it could have been that two, we had two evolving processes. For example, the, the homochirality would be different to this process would be different in the northern or the southern hemisphere because it depends on the orientation of the sun. You know, it depends on this, um, the orientation, whether it's in the south or whether it's in the north, you get different homochirality. So in the, in the northern hemisphere, it could have been right-handed in the afternoon, and in the southern hemisphere, it would be left-handed in the afternoon. So it may have been that life evolved in two different hemispheres, and then somehow one of the hemispheres went over the other one. But I think most people uh, suppose that life only arose uh, through uh, one, uh, at least localized in one region, and uh, homochirality was the beginning of life. Sorry? Well, we haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> but it would be different. The homochirality would be different in the north or the south in the afternoon, you know, which is the afternoon, the temperature is breaking the symmetry. Maybe more a technical question. Uh, what does the convolution does to the circular decreasing and how did you obtain information from there? Because it looks uh, not the same, but yeah. more or less. Okay. Well, this is the uh, dichroism spectrum. Okay, so that measures the difference in the absorption between right and left-handed circular polarized light on DNA on these different samples, these three samples. Uh, but we have a, a light spectrum which is coming into Earth. And so, for example, in this region, there's no light. And so we have to normalize for that. And how do we do that? We take the convolution of these, the absorption, plus the incident light spectrum. And that gives us this, this graph. Basically the same, but it's just including the convolution of the, the incident light and the absorption spectrum. Okay. Uh, no, because in fact this light, uh, uh, ultraviolet light UVC range is blocked by the ozone. But uh, I would like to remind you that ozone is also a life-produced molecule. You know? It's produced by life, the oxygen. So it's like a pigment also. It's also a pigment. You can consider, can consider it a pigment. Now what has happened is that life has been gradually going towards greater intensity into the visible region of the spectrum because in the visible region of the spectrum, there's a lot more light. But the problem is that uh, the, the energy in one photon in the visible region is not enough to do these molecular transformations. No? So we have more light, which was in the visible. But you cannot do molecular transformations. You won't do a rotation around a covalent double bond with visible light. No? You can do it now with very complex biosynthetic pathways, which have gradually evolved. No? And they produce ATP, for example. No? Using ATP, you can do the rotations and the reconfigurations of the molecules. But uh, it, you need this light, and that's what I'm saying. If you want to look at stars which, which uh, have life, it would be a good idea to base it on stars which emit in the ultraviolet. So the M-type stars, for example, uh, if this theory is correct, should not have life, or at least life origin of life. It may have life transported from other planets but not the origin of life, no? So we need G-type and F-type and K-type stars in order to get this type of dissipative, microscopic dissipative structuring molecules. Thank you very much. Thank you.